trust. There is no willingness to sacrifice. Nothing of worth, including nations, can be built without sacrifice. But it all begins with the willingness to operate in alignment with truth. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this public lecture hosted by the International University of the Caribbean, where we consider matters pertaining to good governance, democracy, and public trust. Under the patronage of former Prime Minister of Jamaica, the most honorable Percival James Patterson, today's exchange has been organized to not only stimulate thought, but draw insight and inspiration from the South African experience as we continue the work here in Jamaica of systemic transformation. We wait with bated breath to hear from Professor Kumalo, Dean of Religion and Philosophy at the University of KwaZulu-Natal, South Africa. Permit me to acknowledge at this time Mr. Omar Ryan, representing Most Honorable P.J. Patterson, our patron, and Dr. Timar Stevenson, Senior Education Officer within the Policy Analysis, Research, and Statistics Department of the Ministry of Education, representing our Minister of Education. Members of the faculty and staff, students, those joining online of the International University of the Caribbean, ladies and gentlemen in the audience, thank you all for being here. Truth finds its groundings in God. And so the Reverend Dr. Samuels, Minister of the Hope United Church, will lead us in prayer, after which Mr. Alexander Bourne, Acting Chancellor for the IUC, will bring opening remarks. Let us pray. Loving God, we pause now in adoration and praise of your holy name. O oh God, we acknowledge you as Lord of Lords and King of Kings. We thank you that you have come among us, tabernacled among us. We thank you for the redemption in you so that, Lord, we can lead a fulfilled life. We come now, Lord, to inform ourselves of good governance, democracy, public trust. How we pray, Lord, that you will develop these in us and help us to live them. We place this evening's proceedings into your hands and beseech you to lead us. We pray that you will be in our thoughts and intentions and guide the way we beseech you to Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Our Master of Sermon is the Reverend Asta Carlisle. Mr. Omar Ryan, representing the Most Honorable P.J. Patterson, former Prime Minister of Jamaica. Dr. Timar Stevens, Senior Education Officer and representing the Honorable Fable Williams, Minister of Education. Professor Kumalo, guest lecturer. Dr. Irene Walters, I see somewhere in the audience, former Chancellor, just stepped outside. Professor Roderick Hewitt, President of the International University of the Caribbean faculty and staff of the IUC. Ladies and gentlemen, esteemed colleagues, distinguished guests, friends all, good afternoon. It is with great honor, love, and a hope for a better tomorrow that on behalf of the International University of the Caribbean, I welcome you to this significant event. Whether you have come in person or have joined online, we are delighted you have taken time to attend this public lecture. Today, we gather not just as individuals, but as a collective of minds eager in the pivotal discourse of good governance, democracy, 
and public trust. Themes that resonate deeply within the heart of Jamaica and echo across the global expanse. We are privileged to host this public lecture in collaboration with the University of KwaZulu-Natal, an institution that shares our dedication to fostering academic excellence, peace, and societal transformation. We're equally privileged to host this lecture under the patronage of former Prime Minister, the Most Honorable P.J. Patterson, himself an advocate for good governance, having dedicated much of his public and political life, as well as his post-public service life, to enhancing Jamaica's democracy and governance structures. Our speaker today, Professor Kumalo, a luminary in the field of religion and philosophy, will no doubt enlighten us with insights that bridge the Jamaican experience with the universal challenges and aspirations of governance and civic engagement, and perhaps the importance of our faith in God as an integral component to this discourse. In Jamaica, our vibrant democracy is a testament to the resilience and spirit of our people. The discourse on good governance and public trust is not just academic, friends. It is the very fabric that binds our society. We are reminded that democracy is a living organism, nourished by transparency, accountability, justice, and the relentless pursuit of equality, among other things. So today, as we delve into this lecture, let us be inspired by our rich heritage of scholarly pursuit and civic activism. Let us embrace the broader perspective that Professor Kamalo will present, using them as a lens to refine our understanding and as a tool to carve out a future where public trust is not just a commodity, but the cornerstone of governance. To the young scholars, leaders, activists among us and online. Let this lecture be more than a moment of learning. Let it be a call to action, a catalyst for innovation, and a blueprint of the Jamaica we yearn to build. Together, may we rise to the challenge of shaping a world where governance is not only good by measure, but also just and kind in spirit. Friends all, Wisdom tells us that every meaningful journey begins somewhere. Wisdom also tells us that change is championed by people. It is said that without a vision, the people will perish. But without people, any vision will perish. We also know the state of the Jamaican landscape. It is not what we want it to be. It is characterized by system failures and the less noble fact or matter of corruption. But we also know that Jamaica is not starting from scratch. We are on a journey and we're heading to a better place. And there are people like you who are willing to dedicate yourselves to champion, championing the cause of a better Jamaica. So ladies and gentlemen, it is in that spirit that I greet you, the hope for a better Jamaica, a better world. Thank you for your presence, your engagement, and your commitment to the journey ahead. Let us begin, and may we have a wonderful lecture. God bless you. Thank you very much, Mr. Bourne. Every tree springs from a seed. Every movement begins with a thought. Professor Roderick Hewitt, president of the IUC, will give us the background to this public lecture. Professor Hewitt. Thank you very much, Reverend Carla, and I want to join with my colleagues in also expressing uh, my warm appreciation for your presence. Uh, on behalf of the IUC community, its management, staff, our students, and our alumni. It's indeed a great opportunity to warmly welcome you and to have 
these distinguished friends, colleagues with us. Uh, I want to follow due protocol and to ensure that I welcome the representative for our most honorable former Prime Minister P.J. Pattison and representing the Minister of Education, um, Dr. Ann, who is here with us. As I welcome you to the IUC lecture, although the invitation went far and wide, I want to at least acknowledge that this is as international a gathering as you could ever get, even with the numbers seemingly um, not great. We have some of our international students with us and to listen to the countries for which they represent. We have our colleague from uh, Tahiti in the Pacific. Can you wave your hand and look around there? Yeah, that's from French Polynesia. We have from South Africa. Uh, wave a hand for, for South Africa. Uh, he's around there. From Taiwan. Uh, we have from India, uh, there are two of them from India and from uh, Bangladesh. Okay, we, there are some others who left for the long journey home. We had loved ones from Guyana, from Trinidad, from Samoa in the Pacific. Uh, they have left ahead uh, this, their their training program comes to an end uh, this week, and then they begin to make the long journey, journey home. It speaks volumes to our commitment here at IUC uh, in terms of internationalizing what we are doing here. That's why to, we took the time to ensure that this public lecture is held Doc, we have Professor Kumalo that you have been told about. Um, for, for better or for worse, I have worked with my brother since 2010. I returned home 2019, and he's still a brother. <laughs> we invited him for our graduation. That will be on Wednesday. <laughs> of this week, on Thursday, sorry, of this week. Uh, and we are so excited because a part of the development is that our master's and doctoral program, we have worked over time to ensure that our students are exposed to African Academia of Excellence. <laughs> we have struck partnership with UKZN and uh, most of our doctoral students will now be registering through them to ensure that their doctoral degrees and those who do masters by research, as you know, UKZN is in the top 300 university in the world today. It's number two within the South African context. And it is known as the African Institution of Excellence. So we are looking forward to that. We have the Dean with us, the Dean of Religion, Philosophy, and Classics from the school. And he will engage with us on this important topic. Why? issues about good governance, democracy, and public trust. It's not because it's unique to South Africa or Jamaica. We chose that topic because it is of global significance in terms of what's happening north of us, 
in the great United States struggling with its own democracy? What is happening over in Europe? What is within the Asian continent, within the African continent? If there is a topic that requires consistent focus, it is this. And we thought that within IUC, under our, well, we have Mr. Bourne as our current chancellor, in our previous chancellor, um, Dr. Irene Walter, we established the IUC Peace Institute because we wanted to centralize peace building as core. Issues of good governance and public trust must become part of the curriculum. If we don't do that, we are going to be turning out into our society renegades who make corruption uh, a doctoral gift to, to aim for. And we believe, therefore, interrogating issues of good governance, democracy, must not become optional in academic discourse. And I'm glad the rep from the Ministry of Education is here. I had a chat with the former prime minister. Why? I must say this. If there is one political leader in this country who has made this issue of public trust, democracy, and good governance central to the, his political discourse. The former prime minister is known for that. And not only that, since he left office, he has been advocating it in all the sectors. And the current government and those before, they have embraced that perspective. And beyond Jamaica, other countries are listening to his pan-African perspectives. And Dr. Professor Kumalo is one of those South African who is a true pan-Africanist. He's a Zulu man from the Kumalo tribe of King Chaka. We are honored in having him with us. And I hope and pray that as we listen to him, it will also trigger many of us who want to aspire for more and deeper learning and research to link up and to say, I want to register through the IUC and to become connected to the postgraduate studies program of the, U of the UKZN. We'll be most happy to welcome you in the wide offerings, the disciplines that are there to be offered. So to you, my brother, and to our current chancellor, we want to present this public lecture, not only as a gift to us who are present in person, but to the wider Jamaican society, those who are listening online. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Hewitt. Before receiving greetings from our patron, delivered by Mr. Omar Ryan, and from our Minister of Education, delivered by Dr. Timar Stevenson, let us listen to this musical presentation from Dr. Lester Lewis and Singing Rose. Put your hands together for them. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Omar Ryan. I'm delivering a message on behalf of the former Prime Minister, the most honorable PJ Patterson. With all protocols observed, 
Hi. Good evening again. The P.J. Patterson Institute for Africa Caribbean Advocacy wishes to extend commendations to the International University of the Caribbean for staging this public lecture. When as statesman in residence at the University of the West Indies, I received your kind invitation to be patron of this event, I had no hesitation in accepting. Mr. Omar Ryan has been assigned to convey this fraternal message on my behalf to indicate my fullest support on this very special occasion. Let me extend a hearty and sincere Jamaican welcome to our distinguished presenter, Professor Simon Gieliso Kumalo, as he visits with his brothers, sisters, and cousins on this side of the Atlantic. The topic you have chosen, Pan-African Reflections on Good Governance, Democracy, and Public Trust, is of high contemporary relevance in the developed and developing world alike. We are eager to learn from the Dean of the School of Religion and Philosophy of the University of Quazo, KwaZulu-Natal, the history, traditions, and practices of those who long before the invasion of European imperial powers had developed throughout the African continent their own systems and culture of tribal governance and accountability. I believe that we are truly at another pivotal point in our evolution as African and Caribbean people when we need to take stock, engage in deep reflection, and reinfuse our efforts at achieving the African-led renaissance and its promise of cultural, spiritual, socio-economic and political renewal and ultimately construct an inclusive and sustainable model for development. Emancipation, independence, and the Civil Rights Act were unquestionably all milestones of tremendous significance. But we must not lose sight that each was preceded by many years of steadfast struggle, determination, and an unwavering desire by our people to create social and economic conditions in which they could experience the values of freedom and dignity. We must build on this legacy to gain steady improvements in our quality of life as well as in our capacity to contribute respectively to, develop, to the development of Africa, the Caribbean, and the diaspora. We must do it ourselves, for we have seen the disastrous consequences when others seek to impose their own models on us. Within the context of Pan-Africanism, the role of civil society in charting our course for good governance and sustainable development is clearly an imperative. We need to shun elitism and provide our citizens with equal opportunities to live decent and fulfilling lives, imbued with knowledge of self and pride in their heritage and rightful place in this single planet we share. We have to join as one to widen the long-standing and deep-rooted connections across the oceans and fashion how to build strong and enduring partnerships that promote growth, security, and peace which embraces the whole human race. I am confident that we will be greatly enriched at what can be learned from a stimulating lecture. From the professor who is an erudite scholar and eloquent speaker on this topic. I hope the lessons will attract widespread dissemination and not be confined to those in attendance. I wish you a memorable occasion and stimulating discourse as we seek to fashion 
a genuine participatory democracy which will allow the voice of the people to be heard and ensure equal rights and social justice for all. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, with the protocols already established, I am here to bring greetings on behalf of our Honorable Minister, Fiebel Williams. It is my great pleasure to bring greetings on behalf of the Ministry of Education and Youth, and in general, our Minister, the Honorable Fiebel Williams, in particular to this year's International University of the Caribbean Public Lecture. The Ministry welcomed this as an important channel through which public discourse can take place on matters of great public interest. I also join in extending special welcome to our guest presenter, Professor Kumalo, Dean of the School of Religion and Philosophy from the University of KwaZulu Natal in South Africa. The theme for this evening, governance, democracy, and public trust is quite topical as citizens across the world are increasingly seeking to have a greater say in how they are governed, as well as the impact this may have on public trust. These are issues we have been grappling with in Jamaica for a number of years. For many people, the withdrawal from participation in certain aspects of public life is an outgrowth of a deep distrust between the citizenry and the authority figures. We at the Ministry of Education and Youth believe that through the recently announced reintroduction of civic education, we can help to reverse much of the cynicism and withdrawal. The reintroduction of civic education in schools is specifically aimed at creating self-awareness by awakening the social consciousness and social responsibility of Jamaicans. Furthermore, the aim is to contribute to young Jamaicans' understanding of themselves as individuals and members of groups with God-given abilities, gifts, and or talent that are critical to national development. Sensitizing Jamaicans to their roles and responsibilities as citizens is critical. Furthermore, as a democratic society, it also depends on its citizens being well informed and prepared to act. Our aim is that the guidelines provided and used by teachers will help to strengthen the foundation for a successful and balanced society in which our people appreciate the rules that govern the relations we have with our fellow citizens and our government. Additionally, these rules set out the framework not just for our daily life, but also for the future of generations to come. We also believe it is important to emphasize that civic education take place in a cultural context. We must teach our students about their history, where they are coming from, and where they intend to go. We want to see students who have a healthy consciousness of themselves as Jamaicans, who know their place of dignity, of worth, who understand their rights and their obligations as citizens of the country. We want to build students' education and awareness of the ways in which citizens can actively participate in Jamaica, diverse and inclusive society. Within this context, 
I am sure that this evening's public lecture and the discussion that will follow will enrich our appreciation of the nexus between civics education, good citizenry, governance, and public trust. We look forward to an enlightening discourse. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. Mrs. Hazel Graham has been tasked with the responsibility of introducing our guest speaker who has crossed many waters and waves to be here with us today. But we need to ensure that at this time we are taken on the waves of music. And so I invite Dr. Lester Lewis and the Singing Rose before Mrs. Graham comes. One, two. Can you say yeah, man? Yeah, man. <laughs> yeah, man. Yes, 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 right? yes, yes. Come yes. on, one, two, three. Yeah, man. Yeah, man. <laughs> Lord is good. All the time. Is it on? Okay. It's not on. Yeah, yeah. I'm also, I've been to South Africa once. Yeah, man. So it's starting again. Thank you, Professor. <laughs> this song I'm going to sing for you. Listen very carefully. Oh. The 21st century ushered us into a world of globalization. Economic uncertainty, health epidemic, and political deceit. The disintegration of the family structure. Compromise, terrorism, social and sexual confusion. The missing ingredients is character, character, character. The missing ingredients is character, character. If there's one thing that has magnified itself in the century. It is the blunt display of defective leadership in every arena. Mm. Politicians break their own laws. Religious leaders violate the morals they expose. Business tycoons betray the trust they develop, while athletes break the rules they swear by. Truly, they are hard to find. Missing ingredients is character, character. Character, the missing ingredients is character, 
character, character. Doctors ignore their code of ethics and sore notes. Teachers sleep with students they should protect. Priests take advantage of little children they expected to serve. While husbands abuse the wives they vow to honor and corruption is the culture of our global society. Oh God, true leaders are hard to find. And missing ingredients is character, character, character. I want everybody, come on. Character, character. Come on. Character. Character. Put your hands to it. Come character, on. Mm. Come character. On. Come on. Mm. Character. The missing character. ingredients is correct. Character. Come on, lift the voice. Come on. The living ingredients is correct. Character. Character. Missing ingredients is correct. Put your hands together. Come on. Scream. <laughs> Could you roll the track for me, brother? This one said corruption has to go. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 Corruption has to go. Oh. Roll it through. Now come up. I right, want this. Let's sing it to the guitar. <laughs> you did it? <laughs> corruption has to go. Yes, sir. Let me hear it. And he knows the address of every man and woman. So cease. Join me, baby. To build a strong and healthy nation. We must get rid of immorality. Corruption have no place in this blessed country. So let your neighbor know for this economy to grow. Corruption have to go. Corruption have to go. Corruption have to go. Corruption have to go. Scrupulous behavior have, to go. have no place in this nation. Degradation, degeneration, and fraud have to go. I don't hear you. This 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 and this honesty have to go now. Have to go. For this economy to grow, oh God, sing, sing. Corruption not, not to go. Come on. Corruption not to go. Let me hear you. Come on. Corruption not to go. Come on. Corruption not to go. Wickedness and shadiness have to go. Have to go. Scrupulous behavior have, to go. have no place have to in go. this nation. Distortion, iniquity, and bribe have to go. Have to, have go. to, have to go. go. You have to sing it now. Come on. And vice have, have to go, go now. Have, have to, to go. go. <laughs> 
Come on. You have to put your hands together, you know. Yeah. Called Takwa. Come on, come on. Hit it hard. Hit it. Corruption up to go. Corruption up to go. Come on. Corruption up to go. Let me say. Corruption Let me say. Corruption up to go. Corruption up to go. Oh God. Corruption up to go. Don't embarrass yourself. Don't embarrass your children. We must grow professionally. Advance the world. Come on. Have to go. Everybody. Corruption have to go. Corruption have to go. Easy, easy. Next tune. All right, before you start it, this is what I am the message that I'm getting from heaven as an ambassador of Christ to sing it. And once God say it, he will begin to unveil people who are in corruption. Amen. So we must never be in corruption. Amen. Now, Africa, great. Africa what? Great. Africa what? Great. Let me say Africa do. Great. Great. You say you want the teaching at the school, right? This is it. Ready? Let me put on this guitar. Mama Africa! Tribute from Jamaica with Kairos creation. Africa great. Africa great. Africa great. Africa great. Africa great. Africa great. Make no mistake. Africa great. 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 I'm so glad I live to see African people coming together. Sitting down at the table, one Africa speaking with one voice, taking full responsibility of our future and our destiny. Who God bless, no man curse. Thanks to the Almighty. We are not the worst. We sing Africa great. Africa great. On Africa great. Africa great. Africa great now. Africa great. Africa great. Africa great. Make no mistake. Africa great. Let me say Africa great. Africa great. Africa great. Africa great. Rising from the Ashes of slavery, colonization, exploitation, and oppression. But in spite of all these atrocities, the Almighty God has given us the victory. 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 We will no longer be instruments of our own degradation. We will take a stand against the devil's plan. Come on. And walk away from fake independence. We walk away from plastic security. Never again to be colonized by evil men. Everybody. Africa great. Africa great. Africa great. Mr. Africa great. 
Africa great. Make no mistake. Africa great. Oh, Mr. Africa great. Africa great. Africa great. Africa great. Africa great. African leaders are determined to rise and build with dignity, loyalty, and stability. Stability. From Cape Town to Cairo, let the mighty rivers of fairness and justice flow. The leaders of integrity and character. The continent of Africa, Africa can, can never, never fail. fail. Who God bless? Who God bless? No man curse. No man curse. Thanks to the Almighty, we are not the worst. Let me say, Africa great. Africa great. Africa great. Africa great. Africa great now. Africa great. Let me say, Africa great. Africa great. Make no mistake. Africa great. Let me say, Africa great. Africa great. Let me say, Africa great now. Africa great. Let me say, Africa great. Africa great. Let me say, Africa great. Africa great. Africa great. Africa great. I miss the Africa great. I miss the Africa great now. Africa great. I miss the Africa great. Africa great. Make no mistake. I miss the Africa great. Woo! Come on, scream, make some noise. Africa great. Yeah, man. Council members and of course our friends of the University of the Inter International University of the Caribbean a pleasant afternoon today I am privileged to introduce our guest speaker professor Simangaliso Kumalo is professor of religion and governance at the University of KwaZulu Natal Pete Marisburg and Dean of the School of Religion of Philosophy and Classics at the University of KwaZulu Natal. He is the director of the Institute of Religion, Governance, and the Environment in Southern Africa. He is also the co founding editor of the Critical Investigation on Humanitarian Aid in Africa. He is also the immediate past president of the Seth Mokitimi Methodist Seminary in Pete Marisburg, South Africa. His research focus is on religion and governance, religion and environment, church and politics, and public theology, and the social history of Methodism in South Africa. He has written four books, namely, From Forest to Desert, a, modern, a Model of Ministry in Communities of the Poor, Methodists with a White History and a Black Future, the people called Methodists in KwaZulu Natal, Johannesburg. Pastor and Politician, Essays on the Legacy of John L. Doob, the first president of the African National Congress, and an approach to African political theology, the contribution of J.B. Mizi to religion, culture, and politics in Swaziland. Please w join with me and extend a warm welcome to Professor Kumalo. Thank you. I 
I have been waiting for this moment that I can remove the jacket. My brother and uh, president of the International University of the Caribbean, uh, Professor Roderick Hewitt, um, whilst he was still with us, we used to call him Mkize, which is one of the most prominent surnames, Zulu surnames, was Zulu Natal. I'm not surprised that he, you don't seem to know that one. He kept it a secret from you. <laughs> But that's how we called him down there. Um, the council members um, of the university, the chancellor, uh, Mr. Alexandra Bourne, program director, the former prime minister, and the minister of education's representatives who are here, staff of this great university, uh, brothers and sisters and students and those who are here. I greet you all. Um, this evening. It is indeed a great privilege and an honor for me to have been invited uh, to come and speak in this inaugural lecture. I have had a funny experience that at least more than three people have come forward and told me that actually I look younger in real life than I am in the pictures. And I'm not very sure how to feel about that one. <laughs> I'm still trying to figure out. I find comfort from believing that those of us who, you, who look younger than we really are, it means that uh, when the Lord created us, it was on the Monday when he was still quite fresh and enthusiastic of making human beings. And those who look older than their age, unfortunately, they were created just before the weekend. The Lord was very in a hurry to finish and go. Um, so I'm comforted by this belief that I look younger than I really am <laughs> in real. And I try to tell people that if, you, if I don't look old in my face, at least find comfort when you look at my hair. <laughs> they tell the story, uh, but people still don't believe me. But it is a, a great privilege to be here and it is indeed standard protocol for every speaker to start by saying they feel honored uh, for having been invited and say all those good things. That's a good way to start a speech. In this case, I'm not just being customary. I mean what I'm saying. It's a privilege to have been invited here. I know that at your disposal, you've got so many great people and great speakers that you would have invited to be with you. It's not for the first time that I am here. I came here, I think it's now uh, up to 10 years, a decade ago, when I came for the first time uh, to Jamaica. But you also know that um, uh, through people like uh, Bob Marley and uh, Peter Tosh and others, uh, Jamaica is always with us, wherever we are. Um, we, we are followers. Um, of the great music, the music of protest, like just what we've had uh, today. Thank you indeed to Dr. Lester for this wonderful rendition. And thanks to the speakers who have just come before me to, to welcome um, me, and thank you for the introduction. Again, it's quite a warm one. This topic that has been given um, to me uh, by uh, Professor Hewitt and the leadership, you, you would think that looking at where Africa is today, if you are wanting to talk about good governance and democracy, um, I don't think it's a good idea to get an African to come and talk about that here. We are not well known uh, for being um, followers and believers and keepers of good uh, governance and democracy. In fact, when this rendition was made, the music was made here, if I had so much money, I would make sure that I take my brother here to just go and sing in parliament in South Africa and in other African countries, because I think really 
um, he will have a very, very good audience there to listen to this music uh, that he has just given to us. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm telling you, uh, well, we, we might then need to, to prepare that uh, he's there eternally. He might not be able to come back alive <laughs> to this part of the world after singing this great music and giving us this challenge. But it is, um, ideally, is the kind of topic that we should all be talking about. Um, issues of good governance and democracy concern all of us. Um, and it is good that we are having this lecture, and as you are going to hear maybe as I continue, unlike having it in the corridors of power and higher education, because we've done that uh, for time immemorial, but it looks like lectures have not made any difference, especially those that are political. And maybe it is good that they are held in places of worship. Because maybe as we deliberate um, the spirit of God and the teachings that we hold dear of scriptures will add even value, more value to what we say. So that it's not just an academic exercise, but it's something much bigger that talks to us, talks to our minds, talks to our hearts and also lead us to acting in a, way, in a manner that brings a difference uh, to society. Jean Rousseau, who is one of the key um, thinkers and founders of democracy, once wrote that democracy is the worst form of governance, but it is better than the rest. So that's why we keep it. Um, because any system that talks about being the voice of everyone is at the same time, whilst ideally it is perfect, but it also runs uh, into the risk, maybe, of leading to chaos where everyone just believe that they have the right to be, to think, to do, but, and forget that the right goes with responsibility. And so that's the challenge that he was reflecting upon. The whole idea of Pan-Africanism, which of course, uh, democracy as we know, there are two things that democracy is not. Firstly, democracy is not African. So no wonder, as Africans, we've always been struggling for centuries to try and adapt democracy. And out of the 54 countries in Africa, you can only count a bit less than five that are a model of democracy. For decades after freedom, people have been trying to inculcate democracy. But in democracy, the way we know it, in the Western form, has not thrived in Africa. So it's work in progress to try and understand the kind of democracy that will talk to our people and make a difference and change in their thinking. I think it's still work in progress very much. The Western form of democracy as we have it has not worked. It's not that just Africans are impossible people who do not want to be democratic. Something is just not working out there. You know, it, something is not gelling between them and Western form of democracy. Underline the fact that I'm using Western form of democracy as we know it. The whole idea of a pan-Africanism, pan-Africanism, the consciousness of being an African, and not only because things are working out well in Africa, but the consciousness of being an African, even when things don't seem to be working well, but one deciding to remain proud of being an African. There's something deeper there. Because had it been according to our performance in the standards of this world, 
politically, economically, and all that, I think a whole lot of people would have dumped the idea of Pan-Africanism because it is actually embarrassing. Who wants to be identified with something that seems to be failing? But people remain Pan-Africanist. There's something bigger and something deeper in that consciousness. The decision to identify with being an African, especially in a world that is anti-African. You know? To decide and stand with that consciousness and choose it, even when it doesn't seem to work, and try to say, I will remain conscious of being an African. And that needs to be celebrated. A whole lot of people, in fact, would pray and wish that they would wake up one morning being something else other than African. Because maybe that would open doors in the world for them. But a whole lot of people decide to consciously remain African, even if they are in places of comfort where they are. When maybe they don't need to identify as African, and maybe they don't need Africa, in fact, Africa needs them, but they decide to remain African and make noise about being Pan-Africanist. It's a choice. It's a conscious choice to do that. It's not just an issue of color. Color, maybe, it starts from there. But of course, some people who are as black as anything else are actually so white in themselves, more than the whites themselves. So to decide to consciously hold on to the issue of being an African, to decide that when you decide to, to have a lecture, an inaugural lecture in a university, that you are starting in this part of, nothing compels you to go and get some Zulu young man in South Africa because he's African and then bring him up here to talk. Nothing compels you to do that except the consciousness that is built by Pan-Africanism that runs in the blood of some of our people who are scattered all over the world. And I think that has to be appreciated. The issue of public trust, for us, in many ways, it is, in, in South Africa, we call it uh, the social con contract, where government and, and people who are in government understand quite clearly that they are there to serve the public, not themselves. And, 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 and people trust. They give their trust. And in fact, that's what we do when we go and vote, isn't it? We, we give our trust to some people to represent us. And I think that is, it's at the heart of democracy that we, we allow, and in fact, it also comes from our culture, uh, in, the, in, in, the, in the African culture of leadership and traditional forms of leadership, representatives, the local chief and the king, were people who were entrusted by the public to be custodians of the resources of the community, especially the land. Because that's where life started. If you are entrusted um, with taking decisions over the land on behalf of people, the rest has been given to you as power. And so a chief or a traditional king would always be there to distribute land to any member of the, 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 the community who is needing to expand the, the family and build their own house and have a piece of ground to, to, to plant and, the, and then say, we exist because we've got a piece of land that validates our belonging. And that, was, that power was given to the, to the chief 
to the leadership in there. And once you've got that land, it's yours, it's for, for your children, for your children's children. But you also know quite well that the moment your family line has run out, that land will also be given over to another emerging family. Whilst no one was supposed to take the land from you whilst you are there, but you also had no right to claim that the land was yours because you didn't pay any money for it. Because in the African culture actually, and in reality, not just African culture, when we think, how do you actually attach monetary value to land? What formula is used that is proper other than the ones that we make ourselves to actually attach monetary value to a piece of land? Something that is eternal. Once you've got it to a family line, it's yours for generations to come. The land that I, my family still lives in, even though I've moved on to another land, but my family lives in, it's been part of our family for the past two centuries. It has never been taken away from that. Even my children, 50 years later, when my children and my children's children decide to go back to the community where I was born, they will go there. They, they just need to remember my name and my father's name and say we come from that family. They will be told your land is there. Because no one has enough money to come and take the land and erase my family's name from that land. There's no monetary value. But where do you get that decision to maintain that tradition? It comes from the fact that you need a system of leadership and governance that has got such integrity that it doesn't allow money and corruption to take that land away from the families and sell it to the one who's got money, who comes from nowhere, and then suddenly they own that. And I've actually moved, there's a, there's a, in South Africa, land is getting back, land that was taken uh, during apartheid when our people were moved away and all that, and so land is available, um, and so I've got a new piece of ground myself again in there, um, that I've got, and I already know that if my children always remain under the leadership of the traditional leadership in that community, even my great-grandchildren will still have that land. They will never know me because I would have long died. But when they stay in that land, they will say, our great-grandfather got this land and put our family name on it. And the tradition will continue. Now, public trust in an African perspective, it's when you trust your systems and the people who are custodians of that system to do what is right. Just to do what is right. And you build your governance on those systems and all that. Where democracy has not worked that much in some of the communities, it's simply because it doesn't go that deep. Democracy is about who has got money. Who has got money? People are able, although the ideals, the aims of democracy are not necessarily that, but it is always at the mercy of the one who has got money to manipulate it. Of course, they've got nothing else to, to fear other than jail. In the African tradition, people are afraid of their ancestors. If you mess up this system, things will not go well for you. You may have the money, but things and the spirits will turn against you and your children, so you don't mess up this system. And so you've got a system of governance that has got a soul. It is not hollow. It does not depend 
on the level of moral consciousness of those with power. It goes deeper than that. Now, me and you, there are things that unite us. There are things that bring us together. The seas and the rivers and the mountains of this world might have divided us and kept us apart. But there are things that even if we wanted, would never undo those things. And they unite us. Of course, as I've already started, we, we all find consciousness and pride on being Pan-Africanist. Just saying, no matter what the world thinks about Africa and Africans, but we remain proud Africans. And it's by choice. We can be something else if we want it. But we make the choice that we decide to identify with being Africans. Over and above the color, the color is obvious, okay? The color is obvious, I'm not going to talk about that. But over and above that, we then decide to have the consciousness of being Africans and identifying with Africa. That makes us to be one people. And we also have, we share the same source of origin. We have the same experience of being marginalized. We are only safe and more comfortable when we are within our borders. The moment we get out of our borders, no matter how rich and educated we are, the world has a way of reminding us that you belong to a certain status in society. It finds different ways just to remind us, even when we've been so comfortable that we've actually forgotten who we are. The moment we step out of our comfort zones, <laughs> the world finds ways of reminding us who we are and where we belong. And then we also have the responsibility of building our countries and our people because our pride is not complete as long as the majority of Africans are left behind. You, you remember the story of Moses um, when he was liberating the, the Israelites. And so um, they, they do everything, um, they are ready to go. Um, and I can imagine, uh, because the, the instruction was that they must go with everybody. Everybody must go. And um, I can imagine, it's me being a theologian and not a biblical scholar. I'm not a biblical scholar, but I'm a theologian. It's me being a theologian here, uh, imagining uh, Pharaoh and uh, Moses, the last uh, moments of goodbyes, and Pharaoh saying, you know, Moses, um, you don't actually need to take everybody with you. You, you, you see, um, there are things here we are not used to doing for ourselves. We've always had your people uh, to do those things. We, we can't do our washing and we can't be uh, cleaning up on our babies and our rooms and all those of, and our streets and all that. Why don't you leave the elderly to continue doing the work that they've been doing in here and the disabled and all those who, who, are, who can stay behind because they'll still have their jobs, they'll still be comfortable here and you, you, you go with the younger people anyway, it's gonna be a tedious journey to go. And um, Moses, I'm imagining, saying, no, we cannot leave anyone because unless we've all left, None of us has left. And they had to leave with everything and everyone, including the wealth of the Egyptians, left with that. And of course, they have not bargained for the road. The elderly got tired. 
The sick needed assistance. The physically challenged needed a hand to hold them up and go. But they did that because they had the conviction that unless we've all left, none of us has left. Unless we are all free, none is free. So we need to, to look after the elderly, hold them by hand. We need to feed the sick, carry them if they need to be carried. The physically challenged picked up if we can pick them up. Because we all have to leave this place of bondage. I think it makes sense, even though it's omitted in the Bible, I tell you. It was there, but they omitted it. Because it is quite radical to say something like that. You know, the, somebody was very sneaky and left that one out. Because the, the morale of the story is that unless we are all free as a people, none is free. And that's the consciousness of Pan-Africanism. That Pan-Africanists, no matter where they are in the world, but they are conscious that the rest of Africa is still left behind. And they would like to participate in the development and liberation of Africans as a whole. Now it is for that reason that you had um, one of those great Pan-Africanists who came from this part of the world, uh, Marcus Garvey, saying the black skin is not a badge of shame, but rather a glorious symbol of national greatness. Who says that in the early 1900s, when actually, in the literal sense, Africa was almost a black continent, or a dark continent? There was hardly anything visible um, that you could boast of at the time. Whatever we boast about today, it's as a result of years and years of research that we've discovered and come to know that, oh, Africans are also doing this good thing, this good thing, this good thing, this good thing, and all that. During that time when he said that, you really had to be brave to come up with that positive attitude about what it means, to, especially because the Bible itself rarely has anything that's positive about blackness. Quote me a verse that celebrates blackness from the Bible. <laughs> There's hardly any verse. It takes time to dig into scripture and come up with something that is pro-black or dark. But on the other side, everything is celebrated. Celebrated. You need to, your sins will be cleaned and be as white as snow and all that, you'll be as white as the, the sheep and all that. The list goes on and on and on about why the others could be. But everything that is black is not lifted up. That's simply from scripture. And so, but you then have people like Marcus Garvey who comes up and sees something good in the midst of the darkness. That must be of God. That's what prophecy is about. It's not about speaking about tongues that we can't understand what they mean. It's a, in fact, if we talk about tongues like those ones, now these are the tongues I want to hear. That sees possibilities where the dominant narratives sees no possibility. And then his message is then picked up by another um, young, vibrant lawyer by the name of Pixliga Isagaseme. You can Google him. He is in the, he's everywhere. Who in 1906, studying at Columbia University in, a, in New York, he gets invited to participate in a debate. Um, and he decides to speak about the title of his speech was uh, The Regeneration of Africa, 1906. And he talks about how beautiful, how possible, how able is Africa. Africa cannot even be compared to the so-called developed European countries. He doesn't want to compare Africa with them. 
not because he's afraid that Africa is going to lose, but because the two are not comparable. Their beauty, power, and culture are different, but very much at par with one another. That's what he says. And one of the things that he says when he finishes, you can quote the, the title of his speech, and then you can read about him, The Regeneration of Africa. The Regeneration of Africa. It's by Pixliga Isaga Seme. Comes from South Africa in my part of the world. Was one of the first black persons to be educated and qualify as a lawyer uh, in South Africa. And then he says in his speech there, he says the giant Africa is awakening from four corners of the earth. Africa's sons and daughters are marching to the future, to the future's golden door. That is 1906. Imagine somebody is praising and sees possibilities for Africa in 1906. And he wins a medal at Columbia University for that speech. He won the 1906 uh, Curtis Medal, which was an annual event, and he won it through this uh, speech that he did. And he's then followed by John Langalbale Ledube, just to give you a few of these people, who is a, a prominent pastor born in 1871 and then becomes, uh, goes to, to the university and studies theology and does all those sorts of things. And looks, and he came from, interestingly enough, his church uh, was the American board mission um, that came to South Africa. And in his listening and he joins the ministry and all that. And he starts the first school to be started by a black person for black people and has to be run by black people themselves. When schools there at the time were divided into two, there were smaller schools which were, white, were for white people. And then there were schools that were built by missionaries, and missionaries were all white at the time, and they were running schools in their own way. And he decided as an individual to start a school that's gonna be for all black people Going to, teachers are going to be black, and the governing council is going to be black, and it's meant to unite black people. The same gentleman goes on to become the first president of Africa's oldest political organization, the African National Congress, which was founded in 1912, January the 8th. The first political organization that proved that Africans had come of age politically, that they were, if you are going to gain power in this world, you no longer need to use spears and wars and all sorts of things. You need to form a political organization to represent your ideals and stand up for. That organization is the one that's running South Africa today of course you understand even if they are messing up, they are old, they've been there for 112 years. So they are not doing so well politically. And I've got trouble with my children every time. We've got elections next year. And my children, the younger generation, they always say to me, Daddy, who are you going to vote again in these elections? Are you going to still vote those corrupted people? Are you still going to vote this party that has messed up and brought us to where we are? Can't you be voting? They've got new parties that are coming up and all that. And, and I, I say to them, I'm sorry, my children. I'm no longer voting for this party. I'm voting for the ideals that they stood for. When no one thought that Africans can ever be organized and come together and stop ethnic fights and petty fights and chasing one another, um, all around, they came together to form a political organization. I, I, I'm no longer voting for the ones who are here. I'm voting for these ideals that this party stands for. 
And if there is a contribution that I can make to try and help and assist and change them, I will do that from inside. But I'll vote for them that they don't collapse and don't close shop. You vote for those who might win and, and run the country. I will vote for these ones that they, at least they are alive. And the dream and vision of what Africans could achieve of forming an organization of their own in a world where political organizations were only white and represented white ideals. I'll just, even if it's me then alone, who vote for that? And even if I, I get the label of being conservative, stupid, backward, and all that, I will live with that. But I don't wish many people do that, but at least some of us must do that. That's the thinking. So why, why all these things that I'm sharing with you um, today? The partnership between the University of KwaZulu Natal and IUC is very critical, friends. It's important because what we are doing, we are saying when other people in the world are crossing floors and uniting with one another, to try and build the kind of society and future that they are imagining. Us also, as the African people, have a responsibility of refusing to be divided by distance and the seas and all that, that we can come together to the table of brotherhood and sisterhood of Africanism and say, how do we learn? from one another? What are the riches that come from African indigenous knowledge systems? The ones that I've just shared with you, like how we viewed land as we still view it today. What are those things that we need to be picking up? The research that needs to be done to discover Africa remains in terms of research and knowledge remains virgin ground that it has been explored. But it is always explored by people either who are coming from Oxford, people who are coming from Cambridge, people who are coming from Harvard, people who come from all those power institutions that have got money, that they can come and do this. We, I always get a request almost on a weekly basis of some PhD student coming from somewhere in this prestigious institution, coming, they want to come, they want to do research um, in, my, in our institution on this topic, on that topic and all that. Some of them come and stay for six months and when they go back to America, usually they come from America and England, suddenly they are the experts on Africa in six months. When no African can come to America or England and stay there, even for four years, no Africa, African would dare claim to be an expert on America or the UK when they go back. They have the humility to admit that these continents are so huge and complex that it takes a lifetime to understand. But we've got people who come to us for two weeks and they come back, they write a paper and it's published and they say they're, they're Africans, they, they're from Africa. Suddenly they know Africa more than the Africans themselves. And we cannot continue that way. And one way of bringing that to an end is when Africans across the seas unite with one another and say our knowledge, we will share it together because we are going to be honest about it. We are not going to be biased. No one is being exploited in the process, but we are all adding value to the common world that we all belong to. That's what this partnership is about. At face value, it may not look lucrative. Of course, good things don't start by being lucrative. It's usually suspicious things that start so well and are so lucrative. But what we are building up here 
When we are going to be opening doors, in fact, we've already opened doors. I was told today that a number of students of IUC have just gone through the process of uh, their qualifications being evaluated by South Africa so that they are allowed to register through the University of KwaZulu Natal so that they can study with us and we can also bring our people to come and study here and learn from your experiences that we don't know much about. I was very much touched some years ago when I came here for the first time. It was May, it was Africa Day. I spoke at the University of the West Indies at Africa Day and they were very hopeful because again I was coming from Africa. They were hopeful that I'm gonna say something sensible. But I was much younger then. I didn't know much in my, and one, one lady asked a question from the back and said, man, my question that uh, has always baffled me is when I hear stories that those African chiefs actually sold our great, great grandparents to the slave owners. They sold our people. And she says, I find it difficult to forgive that. How could they do that and, and, and sell our people in that? And I, in my naivety, trying to make a comment and answer to that, I said, well, well I, I, I don't know what was wrong with them and all that. Um, it was wrong, I agree with you. Um, but I think they were also children of their own time. That's the best I could master at the moment, at that time, to respond to this. But those questions, and you can see the depth of that question. Ten years later, it's still in my mind. I can still see that woman asking that question. That's how profound and how important it is. Can you imagine that through this partnership, we're going to be opening up spaces where your children and my children and our children will sit together at the table of sisterhood and brotherhood and pan-Africanism and begin to talk about these questions and say, why on earth did our people did this to our, to, to, to our people? And they'll find a way to dialogue and move forward together as the same people of this world. That's what this partnership is about. And there is hardly any institution or organization that I have come to know that has created those spaces. Those safe spaces that are going to talk not about white people uh, coming to us and hearing us telling them how we feel and then they cry crocodile tears. It's going to talk about black people talking to black people about one another and what it means to have been divided for generations when at the end of the day we actually belong together and we want to overcome these barriers that we are finding. This is very important for us and we'll do it because in our institution, the University of Wazulu Natal, we've got very clear strategic goals, just five of them, that we stand for. Firstly, it's research and innovation. We are a research intensive institution. We value research. We need to know the world can only be navigated fully by people who know. It is so complex and difficult that when somebody doesn't have knowledge, they don't have power. People who oppress others do that because they've got knowledge. It may be the right knowledge, may be the wrong knowledge, but they know something. The worst thing you can have is not to know. Is not to know. So research is important. We also look at teaching and learning. That leads to entrepreneurship and good governance. We are going to exchange ideas. You have had a different experience of democracy. It is not always the best, because if it was always the best, we would not have had the protest songs of Bob Marley, Peter Tosh, and what we've had today here. 
But I have a sense your experience is better than our experience. And we are going to teach and learn with one another. Teaching and learning in community with others. Which Paulo Freire taught us. We are going to need that. And we are going to do it in this university. The next point. Internationalization is key to the work of the university. That you connect with other partners in the world where you learn together, you teach together, you grow together. That makes you an institution of higher learning with repute. Lastly, community engagement. We value that our knowledge comes from the local communities. The knowledge that is frozen um, has not been retrieved, has not been engaged by people from the corridors of power and the ivory towers of our institution. There's just so much knowledge uh, that comes from there. I I'll give you a good example. I'm a Kumalo. I can trace my surname and the people that I come from back to about 13 generations ago. I am here today not because I happen to be an individual who is here with you. With me, there is a history of all the Kumalo people who had to fight to survive and be there until we are all here. There is so much, there is a body of knowledge that forms the surnames, the names, the totems of our people that still needs to be learned, appreciated, and celebrated. It is when people are proud of themselves and who they are and their roots and their identity that they are not afraid of facing whatever obstacle that comes their way. If you want to disempower people and keep them angry all the time, they cannot be at peace. Just take their identity, who they really are. That they only know just two people back, not beyond that. And think that that's who they are. Whereas they are much bigger than that. They are offsprings of giants, men and women, who weathered the difficult storms of life and oppression and colonization that came their way. They survived not by chance, by resistance. And they need to know that they are where they are today and they've made it to be where they are today because they come from good stock. But things like those cannot be discovered unless we create spaces of research, teaching and learning, dialogue, knowledge that humanizes us rather than dehumanizes us. And so we need to celebrate the work of this university that we are putting together because it is going to make this world a better place for our children. It may do very little for us, but we're building the steps for that. Let me close. Let me close. I've cut a lot of the stuff that I wanted to say, um, but let me close. I close by a short reflection that was shared by a man by Dr. Kachivusa on leadership. And in this, he spoke about, he quoted what the Greeks did in understanding people. The Greeks said there are only three types of people in the world. Only three. All the other ones are just social constructs. You can name them and say whatever you say about them but actually there are just three types of people on earth. The first ones, 
the Greeks believed that the first one, the first group of people are the idiots. Yeah, the idiots. Yeah. By idiots, they did not mean people who are dull or people who are mentally challenged or who are slow. Idiots are people who bury their head, heads on the sand, um, on the ground, and live for themselves. And life is all about them. They can accumulate as much as they can and give to their close family. Uh, their world is just how much I can get for myself. Don't care what happens around them and what happens to others. Uh, they're just about themselves. Those are idiots. That's the first group of people the Greeks said. And then there's a second group of people that they call the tribes people. The tribes people. The tribes people are the ones who are ruled by fear of the unknown and of difference. And a thing that is different from them that they are not used to, they don't want to dare open up their doors to that. They are ready to protect what they already know at all expense. They can declare war just to refuse to open up the doors to something new and fresh that can bring new life uh, to them. And so they are really very much a people who are a warrior people. When they talk about Af Pan-Africanism, it's very narrow and limited that it narrows up to ethnic groups. If there is anything other than their ethnic group, no, 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 the door is closed. They're not ready for that. Even wealth and knowledge is not to be shared and, and opened up to much bigger groups so that we can enrich one another and be a better people. The tribes people are just about themselves. They protect what they know and they protect one another on their own. Then there's the last group. And this is the ideal group. These are the citizens. The citizens. The citizens add value to their own lives and also feel an obligation that they belong to society. That they need to be adding value in making society be better than they have found it themselves. <laughs> Citizen, in this sense, is not referring to holding an ID card or a passport, whatever. That's a very narrow understanding of citizenship. But citizenship is in the sense that is in the line of the gospel that we were created to be human beings in God's image. We have got the capacity and the ability to co-create with God a better world so that by the time we exit, we leave the world with the little difference that we have made. Those are citizens. And where we are, the world that we live in, and what we are trying to do through this partnership between IUC and UKZN is to do away with the mentality of being idiots. Is to do away with the mentality of being tribes people. Is to build up a new culture and cadre of people who are going to be citizens of this world and they will stand up as Africans who are going to make this world different and better. Thank you. It feels almost sacrilegious to speak after Professor Kumalo. Thank God that none of us, by virtue of being here,
can be classified as idiots. <laughs> and by virtue of our desire to ensure that our country gets to a different place, we will break from whatever tribal holes that are in our minds. For definitely we want to be citizens leaving this world better than we arrived. Truthful systems are crucial to the proper execution of the principle of democracy. Systems require accountability with soul. And soul is the consciousness of the essential self. My smuddiness, as the late great Rex Nettleford would have said, and, and do you remember the thought that came that our pride is not complete if the majority is left behind? Unless we have all left, none of us has left. A social collective consciousness that celebrates the human network and network regardless of status, stage of life, or situation of life. I hear Ubuntu coming out. I, I am because we are. I, I'm really touched by this presentation, but, but mine is not the privilege of moderating the question and answer section. I'll leave that to Dr. Grantley Burns Sinclair, Dean of the Mel Nathan College, who will guide our conversations. Good evening, everyone. Thank you very much, Professor Kumalo. We have entered into the zone of clarification. You're going to be asking questions, and you're going to be getting answers. So I'm going to ask that you will raise your hands to be, your hand rather, to be acknowledged, and then you ask your question. It is good if you make your question quite simple, rather than a double, triple barrel question, so that the person who will answer has a more grounded memory of the question. It's question and answer. Please identify yourself and ask your question. Good evening, everyone. My name is Javis Edwards. I'm a student of IUC, where I'm pursuing a bachelor's in business administration with specialization in program and project management. So the question I have, I think it's pretty simple. Um, it was based on something that the speaker said um, early in his presentation, and I quickly jotted it down. Is it that um, or government or democracies, democrac democratic systems rather, are not working because the Western model of governance is built on the foundations that facilitated our slavery. Oh, you want me to ask now? Oh, yes, indeed. Okay. So I'll take your feet. You, you, you have the. Oh, okay, thank you. Um, no, yes, yeah, you, you, I would agree with you um, that there is also this resentment um, towards that system. It, of course it's good, but democracy is the best, as, as, a, as, a, as Rousseau said, that the, it is better than the rest. Because what else would you have? Um, a system that allows people to participate. In, in governance and have their own voice and all that. It's, it's very, very uh, noble. It's the ideal. We all need to be getting into that. But I think partly the, the anger that it is an external system and the way it came 
uh, it was forced on people. People resent things that are imposed on them. Sometimes, even if those things are good for them, but the fact that the way they came, uh, th 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 there is resentment to that. That's the one thing. The other thing that is uh, making democracy to struggle, to adapt, it's again what um, um, the program director referred to. And we, we need to problematize that more. You see, Ubuntu is the ideal for us. I am because we are. You are because I am. We are together. Now, for democracy to thrive, democracy needs rules. And rules and policies and laws have to be enforced. And you, you don't compromise them. If you do compromise them, then democracy doesn't work. It simply just doesn't. It's based on that. The problem with Ubuntu, Ubuntu prioritizes the relationship, sometimes at the expense of rules and laws. Let me give you an example of what I mean. Here, if I got out of this road and started driving recklessly, and your traffic officer sees me, they're going to take the book, throw it at my face, and charge me for that, okay? That's how it is. There's no negotiation. You're either going to pay a fine or you go to jail. In my context, when I get out of here and drive restlessly out here, the person is going to come to me and say, what's wrong? What's wrong, Professor Kumalo? Why are you, can't you see the signs, the roads and all that? Oh, man, I really have to run. Somebody's in hospital. They are needing me to get there, uh, to, to give them communion as a pastor or to do something that is urgent. The moment I say that, Ubuntu takes over the decision on applying the policies of democracy. And democracy suffers. So the fact, in some way, the fact that we, have, we are still built very much on tradition and culture makes it difficult for the policies and systems and rules that hold democracy to thrive. And, and that, that is one thing that is difficult for, for, for democracy to adapt in our context. I'm not saying it's right. I'm not passing any value judgment. Just making a point that one of the things that democracy is struggling to, to thrive in our context is the strong feeling on culture and tradition that sometimes people overlook the policies of democracy. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor. I'd just like to wonder aloud, sir, yeah. if democracy does not to a large extent depend on the integrity of the people over which yes. it is held. Yes, yes, true, true. Yes. Now, the, the, the question is, um, integrity is also relative in some communities. Um, what do I mean by saying it's relative? Is it in some communities when there are situations, I'll give you an example of corruption as we are talking about. It's a huge problem. It's a, it's a huge problem. Um, now, the people who are corrupt, who are running our government, especially today and all that, most of them, when you look and listen, and why are you doing all this? They are simply people who have never, ever experienced to have so many resources at their disposal. They get overwhelmed by what they are having in here, and, and, and they lose the integrity in the process and all that. So in a sense, democracy also 
People, a society needs to grow into and mature into democracy um, and be ready to govern. They must have the relevant or requisite education that you need and have a clear understanding. We are the president, you know, again, we chose with the problem we have. Who chooses a president who doesn't have an education? Take a man who has no education at all and end up becoming a president of a country like South Africa, a CEO of a country like South Africa, huge and complex the way it is. How did people get to elect him to that position? It's because in terms of our understanding and appreciation of the, the power of the vote as part of democracy education, the vote, that my vote, when I vote, what it means and all that. People could not make the connection. And so in most of our, of our positions of power, you've got people who should not be there. They shouldn't be there and they are there. And because they are there, they are messing up. Thank you. Thank you. I see another raise hand. Okay, uh, my name is Paman Lafayaka from South Africa. I'm a team participant member. Um, Prof, um, I've been moving around um, the country here, which I've seen something so common back home, mm -hmm. where I see a conservation of the ruins of former colonial systems in the name of our history, which impedes development. Now, um, my question is that, how do we sit down, based on what you said, voting for ideas? So how do we sit down all together, young and old, to make a conscious decision of breaking away from the conserving manner, which is feeding the corrupt systems of our time, which means that of saving the appealing ideologies of the current systems? No, I think that's a very good question. Yeah, it's a very, very good question that you are raising. In the okay. My thinking is that, is that what is needing to happen, history, history is not always one-sided. Why do we do history? We learn, we go to history in order to understand what happened in the past, which shaped the present, so that from it, we can then shape the future. When you do that, you are able to see what went wrong, what went, what, what went right from the past. And what is it, therefore, that we need to retrieve and take from the past in order to shape the present and shape the future. And so it, 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 it's also a mistake to think that all that is in the past is negative. Because that's not true. If we say that, we are then nullifying even ourselves here because we're also products of the past. So, but the consciousness is to pick up what is good, learn from it, and use what you can pick up from the past to shape the present and the future. The question of, a, <laughs> of, a, of, of conservatism, or, or somebody's even helping me saying the ANC. <laughs> the, yeah, the idea of the ANC. Of the ANC. He will not run. Why, no, why do we vote for why should we, why should we vote for ANC? Why should we vote for ANC? Okay. Who are you going to why vote there for? Vote for ANC? That's fine. I mean, I'm a Nigerian. And I, 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 why should we vote for ANC? Well, and they have not made any difference. They have not changed. Ramapo, Ramaposa, I was, I was hoping that Ramaposa would come there and make a difference. And you said most of these leaders never, never, were not, never had anything. 
when my um, Mandela went before ANC came to power, Ramaphosa was one of the bright future. And he, can, and, and he became very wealthy through ANC on his own business. How can you come through ANC and, <laughs> and, and get those support and, 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 and get there now? See what is happening in, in, with, with ANC? Okay, sir, thank you. Let me, let me then give you a picture of, and I'm sorry about the way you are feeling and all that, but let me tell you, which you might need to know, is that the development in South Africa, the difference that we have had from the time of apartheid to today, it's just unimaginable to even say how much has changed. Firstly, people who were treated as animal and lesser beings have got all the rights of every citizen in the country. Citizenship is equal to everyone. People, when the country was there, they couldn't vote. Our people are voting now. People didn't have houses. When the national budget was being made, it was only made for white people, not for black people. Today, South Africa, if you talk about the social grants, the biggest burden to the national fiscals in South Africa is the social grants. That gives money to live to every citizen who is struggling who is um, who have got children to raise, who's got poverty and all that, people are getting money out of that. The list goes, electricity is everywhere. The list goes on and on. Do we have problems? Yes, we do. You are trying to, to undo a system that has been there for 300 years, in about 29 years. It's almost impossible. We, we couldn't have done overnight. Who has ever done that in the world? If democracies, the so-called model democracies, like America and everywhere, that have been there for donkey years and all that, still have social problems, corruption, all sorts of things that you talk about, how on earth can we then say there is nothing that's happening in our context? We do have challenges. I, I agree with you. But who doesn't have challenges? Everybody. Everybody has got their problems. The fact is you need to work on those problems. Yeah. You know, you need to work on those problems. Put the right people to work and solve those problems that you have. And that's why you've got leadership. If I say to you, in South Africa today, don't vet the ANC. The, there are two parties that are very strong in South Africa that you can vote for. One is EFF, if you made Julius Malema's party. That would get into power today and undo everything that has been there and get us back to where most African countries are today without a twinkle of an eye. You've got the DA, the Democratic Alliance, which you have, which is the former uh, white party in the country and all that. If you go and read their policies, and what they stand for. They are longing for the old good days when white people were privileged and all that. You have left with those three parties. It's the ANC, which is in power. It's got great legacy. It's doing a good and bad job at the same time as trying to find a way forward. You've got others who may destroy everything that you have. No, 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 no. Do you watch, do you watch what happens in our parliament in South Africa? Every day. Our, our, our parliament is a circus because of one party that swears at people in parliament that comes with impossible... Oh my, the list goes on. You, you must go and watch it and read about what I'm talking about. You'll get to know it. Thank you very much. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. that we sold our people. 
I spent 34, almost 40, 40 years in Jamaica. I work uh -huh. with the government here before I retire and started my business. People ask me every day, African, go away because your, grand, your parents sold our people. And what, what, I'm from Edo State, from Benin. And go and Google it. And the, the white people came to Nigeria. And my, my place was Benin Empire. And they conquered Benin Empire and took all our uh, uh, artifacts. We have 5,000 artifacts in Europe. And they are coming back now. So if we actually sold our people, why do we, why did you, can we also give, yeah. no. sell our, 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 our antifacts? Now, my, my, my experience and understanding of the situation in South Africa is different from yours. So let's, let, we cannot um, do it that way. Thank you. Thank you very much. You must also appreciate, you know, that I'm a Jamaican and I know that there have been leaps and bounds in South Africa, the changes have been great. Yeah. And uh, mm -hmm. whilst we as human beings look for the quick fix, I think we must be patient and let things unfold. Yeah. The next question, please. Evening again, everyone. Um, I've recently started to read this book by Noam, Chans Noam Chomsky, um, Profit Over People. And it's really, propose that democracy as we know it in the Western sense is really an illusion because what it's really is, it's really a representation of neoliberalism and the big corporate structures, especially run by the US who has been the main power since or after World War II, where through the Washington consensus and Bretton Woods systems, they have really created this system across the world where you cannot see outside of the Americanized view of democracy. And according to Chomsky, what neoliberalism, neoliberalism have done over the decades, it has circumvented the power of people and there is no more power within our communities. So in my view, to make Democracy as we understand it, not as it's exposed by American um, free market thinkers, so to speak. But all we understand it as a people is that pe the people on the ground need to be educated through political education and history. Because if people are not educated, I find, like I find in Jamaica, a lot of our citizens, they are not educated as to the history of this country yeah. and the political history of this country, particularly things that happened um, since 1938 when we began our journey towards self-government with the labor riots and such in the, across the Caribbean really, but here in Jamaica. And I say this to say that without empowering people, many of the persons who are not here on the ground, democracy as we understand it, it's dead. It, it's, it has to have people, and it has really stifled the inspiration of people to feel like they, they can make a change and a difference. And the thing is, I think a lot, I think probably with the advent of social media and ICT technology, it has given some people a voice. However, I don't think in the real sense our people really have this voice, so to speak. So it's about, democracy is really about empowering the people on the ground, the grassroots, as we would say in Jamaica. Respect. That's really a commentary, not a question, really. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I can, I can just add something on the point that you've just made, that actually when the people are empowered to participate in democracy, they then add value to democracy from their own experiences. From, they enrich democracy from their own experience, life experiences, cultural experiences, whatever you can talk. So it's not only a one-way approach, but they also enrich the system itself. Just that people don't want to understand how people are adding value and improving democracy. That is democracy. Yeah, that is democracy. Thank you very much. Yes. You are next. Yes. Good afternoon. 
My name is Stefan Wright, and I'm a member here at Hope United. Thank you very much, Professor Kumala, for an excellent presentation. So corruption is obviously something which um, is a problem in Jamaica, and in my view, it's becoming increasingly worse. Um, you know, it's something that at one point you used to hear about it on occasion arbitrarily. Now we're at the stage where in Jamaica people are doing polls and the electorate is saying they don't care about it because it's so universal. We have become accustomed to it. We have become immune to it in many respects. Uh, many people are accused of it and it doesn't matter because, you know, everybody is just trying to get ahead by any means necessary. But we understand, we who are trying to be citizens, um, understand the impact that it can have. And so my question is, in the same way that you have had some countries, maybe like Colombia that has gotten rid of crime, um, other countries which have transitioned from developing countries to, you know, closer to economically developed countries, they have, you know, sort of eradicated poverty for the most part, a lot of these Asian tigers. Do you have any examples, maybe except Singapore, of countries that have been corrupt and have moved to a state of being less corrupt, significantly less corrupt, you know, whether it's democracy or whatever other uh, means they have used, and what have they done? How have they done that? Yeah, very, very good question that you are asking. Well, one can also talk of Botswana. Botswana is, a, is an example of a successful democracy that picked up people um, and made them much better. They are diamonds. They still have diamonds. And how they are using those as national assets that every citizen has to benefit from. In Botswana, every child who finishes matric has got money to go to university, whether internationally or within the country. There's just not um, a question about that and other benefits. So Botswana would be a good example of, of that. And, um, and what Rwanda is doing uh, currently, and in fact Rwanda is a very, very interesting example because the, the, the brand of democracy in Rwanda is hated with a passion by advocates of democracy in the West. Paul Kagame is viewed as a villain um, in the West. You can watch that in YouTube and all that. But Paul Kagame, within a short space of time, has taken a country where citizens were at each other's throats in a way that had never been seen before. It is, their economy is growing at 6% this year without any problem. Um, when you go to, to, to Rwanda, uh, it is speak clean, it's beautiful. People are finding jobs. People are creating jobs by themselves. Democracy is lived at the local level um, with different structures and systems that they have and all that they are. So that's an example. Maybe when we get closer, we can also find a few others. But as I was saying, I take it that democracy is work in progress in Africa in a, in a much more um, clear sense. You see that. But the, this country, Tanzania is doing well. Um, it's really promising. And a few others. So it's coming up. It is when we do this kind of dialogues and meetings and partnerships and all that, that we are going to accelerate those developments. Thank you. Paul Buchanan, former member of parliament and lecturer. Um, I just want to use a democracy and get your thoughts on a particular problem that is emerging in Africa. You have seen recently where the superpowers, China, Russia, and the US, they're all over Africa. I have been asked to look at some of the obstacles 
to African Caribbean trade. But there is a critical juncture coming. And I know you might be aware of the, the book, Why Nations Fail, of Power, Prosperity, and Poverty. Now, I heard my Nigerian brother made a point. And one of the obstacles, because in recent years, the balance of trade between Africa and the Caribbean is going down. And the superpower trade with individual African nations are going up. So since over the last decade, there has been a move to increase African-Caribbean trade. In fact, in terms of where the African Union is going, it's looking at Africa and its diaspora so they can get greater value added from their trade rather than everything going to the Far East, to China, South Korea, etc. But the critical juncture that is coming up concerns the observation that my brother made because there are power, power elites in Africa, in South Africa, of which he referred to. And I don't want, and in Nigeria, all of them. I would just like to hear your thoughts on how these extractive institutions, like tribal edicts, the monarchies, like the power elites, and I just want to hear, because there might be private deals that prohibit the trading between Africa and its diaspora. That is a critical juncture that is coming. I want to hear your thoughts as to whether it will succeed, the African-Caribbean Trade Forum, that is pushing Africa, Caribbean trade. I want to hear your thoughts yeah. on whether that democratic process, that citizenry that you spoke about, how much progress has been made, and whether it will enable Afro Caribbean trade. Thank you so much That's it for that very profound question. Firstly, I think where we need to start, um, we need to start with us, things like this, where it's not the superpowers that are pushing just for these things, but it's also us as citizens who participate in shaping these initiatives between our people. And so that's how you could actually understand and appreciate this collaboration between IUC and Guazulu Natal, in a small way, is that kind of collaboration where, because the, the superpowers are also having the power to set ourselves against one another, which we need to avoid. And, and some of the obstacles, in fact, that Africa has not developed uh, in most of, after independence, most of the superpowers who actually uh, we're, 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 we're colonizing Africa, some people from those countries, why is they left from the front door and say they are giving independence to Africa? They came back through the back door to corrupt Africa, you know, through our leaders and all that. That's true, that's a fact, cannot be denied. That we, in a sense, we have never been free we were given the right to govern ourselves, but never given the space to govern ourselves. Because people came back again to the richest country in the world with minerals and all that. Which country is that one? Is the DRC Congo. The DRC Congo is in perpetual war because of their minerals. Because they've got all sorts of minerals and all that. So the superpowers, people from the superpowers, have made sure 
that they put them at a permanent conflict with one another. Whilst they, they fleece the resources and all that for themselves. Now, unless the Africans themselves, be they in the Caribbean and in Africa itself, work together and agree on the terms that they want to see this progress and development happening in a way that benefits themselves together, not against one another, we are not going to make progress. We need to do that. So this thing of uh, those with resources and power deciding who to give what, when, and how, and even amongst ourselves, is not going to work. The issue of uh, China um, and all these people who are now flooding Africa, again, we do need to admit our people are not just um, victims. It's true that our leaders are corrupt. They are corrupted because there are corruptors who do that. And so part of, if these democracies, the superpowers, are committed, genuinely committed to, to, to liberating uh, Africans and all that, let them also stop the, playing the role of scrambling for Africa which they are doing in their own way, through Agoa, through other things, and through other things, and other deals and all, that sometimes are not necessarily um, helpful in the process. Thank you. Thank you very much. I want to thank all of us for participating. We are more educated by your involvement in this question and answer section. Professor, thank you very much, sir. Thank you very much, everyone. Good evening. We have been feted by the, and with the richest of fear. Thank you, thank you Professor. At this time, we have the vote of thanks given by Dr. Aldin Bellinfante, VP of Corporate Compliance. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, time, this thing said four to six, and time has gone, but it was really interesting. And so I'm just going to look at the program and say to everyone that participated in this program, the master of ceremonies, you have been masterful. <laughs> Opening prayer, thank you very much. You have grace, you have, you, you have had God's blessing on us, and we thank you very much, Reverend. Our Chancellor, thank you very much, sir. And what you said in terms of your enlightenment to the audience of our, of our, of our university it was, well, it was well accepted. Musician, we really did not need professor to speak, you know, because your song actually said it all. It's hope. Oh, it's like it's your song. And so we move to some of our special guests. Mr. Or, Mr. Omar Ryan? He has left, okay. I wanted to say thanks to him and to take back thanks to our most honorable prime minister mm -hmm. because most people don't know that he is the Pan-Africanist personified throughout his entire life story and to entire life history. That is what he is, P.J. Patterson. And Ms. and Dr. Timor Stevens, so please take back to the, to the minister for us our special thanks for having sent a representative for representing us. We thank you, sir. But to our guest speaker, sir, we say a special thanks to you because your lecture was insightful, thought-provoking on the topic of which is of immense global significance and indeed 
to this country, and I think our former member of parliament alluded to that, to this country. You shared your expertise and insight with us today on this crucial topic. And it has an invaluable, and it has made an invaluable contribution to our academic experience, opening our minds to new perspectives and challenging us to think critically about fundamental principles that underpin a thriving society. We are very grateful for your willingness also to engage the questions. Throughout your response to our questions were thoughtful, insightful, and thought-provoking. They encourage us to question the assumption, challenge convention with conventional wisdom, and seek out diverse perspectives and critical issues. We are mindful, sir, that the Pan-African path to good governance and there is not a one side, and you alluded to that when you said only five countries out of 54, really you could say a true democratic government. So we understand that it is not one side, one size that fit all approach. Each and every one of us must draw from, that, from our own unique experience, our rich cultural heritage, and our shared aspiration to forge solutions that are truly pan-African in their essence. We thank you, sir. And so, in concluding, we just thank our organizers. All our organizers, they are here seated from IUC, and all our attendees, I extend our heartful gratitude to you, sir, for sharing and for your insightful knowledge. I say, sir, we thank everyone for the IUC community who made this possible, particularly our president. Yeah, particular president. <laughs> we thank you all. God bless you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Belinfante. Our time of fellowship continues after we leave the sanctuary in the church hall where refreshment will be provided. If you're able, please stand for the national anthem.